Hey, this is Alex Leonidas, and today I'm joined by two very special guests, Dr. Milo Wolf and Natural Hypertrophy. They offer some of the best and most informative lifting content, and they also have the physiques backed by years of experience to prove it. Dr. Milo Wolf is the mastermind behind the length and partial research and is recognized by the top experts in the field of exercise science, as well as being a WNBF bodybuilder. Natural Hypertrophy is the king of the noble natties, responsible for reuniting our community and obliterating the low standards that prevail for so long. I highly recommend subscribing to both these two gentlemen. I promise your knowledge and gains will evolve. Their incredibly detailed, nuanced videos are the norm. And of course, today's exclusive is no exception. Welcome to the finale of a hot topic that's been circulating over the last two months, one that almost everyone's addressed. And that is answering the provocative question, is power building an abomination? Or is it the best of both worlds for hypertrophy and strength? Who is it for? And what are the long-term pros and cons? Let's analyze all angles in this legendary debate. I'm honored to be the host, but I won't be the one debating. I'll simply interject with some questions and comments here and there for flow and clarity, just so we're on track. But my job is to hear everything that Dr. Milo Wolf and Natural Hypertrophy have to say and see if we can all come closer to a common agreement. I'm excited to hear your arguments. And for the viewers, after done watching this, post in the comments what makes the most sense to you. Now, it's time to settle things once and for all. Thank you very much for being here, you two. Thank you for having us. I'm looking forward to this. Excellent introduction. Sounds like two champions walking into the arena ready to fight. I just want to say it because the fire has been taken away from me. I just learned that Milo speaks French. So now I can't be as mean towards him because he's my fellow brethren, but... I must admit that this entire thing started because of me. I made a video called Power Building is an Abomination, which uh, many people disagreed with, let's say, and Milo was one of them. So today we're going to have a debate, and hopefully people who are going to take the time to watch this video are going to learn something from us. So what was your stance on this entire thing, Milo? First of all, natural hypertrophy, Alex, thank you for organizing this. Really appreciate it. The first thing I need to say, and I want to wrap this up quickly, is look, I am bigger than you. And therefore, I'm just correct. Like, that's how things work on the internet. Whoever's bigger has the final say. Sorry. On a more serious note, I'll give my actual thoughts on power building. In general, I don't think power building is a nomination. And here's why. First, I think we're coming at this from a very different epistemic position, right? Like, you're trying to get at the truth of how effective is power building for building muscle and for gaining strength from a different perspective than I am. I'll speak for myself. Don't want to put words in your mouth at all. From my end... Looking at the evidence is predominantly what I'm going to draw my assumptions from, my information from, and a starting place for most people. And saying, okay, well, what does the evidence actually say is happening when we try and combine strength work with hypertrophy work? Can we get the best of both worlds? To what extent can we get both at the same time? That's my perspective and where I draw my information and try to get the truth from. So the first thing would be to just define power building. Power building ultimately, at the most basic level, is just trying to combine some powerlifting work with some hypertrophy work. I think for some people, that might mean competing in powerlifting. For some people, it might also mean competing in bodybuilding. For a lot of people, it means neither. So at the most fundamental level, it is just about training to both get better at the powerlift and to gain muscle, right? I think that a lot of the confusion from around this topic, from your video, from my video, and what have you, potentially stems from a difference in also how we saw powerlifting. So for me, powerlifting is a concept. If you look at it as how people practice that concept, or some people specifically, you might come away thinking that, wow, power building really isn't optimal. Now, we need to answer the question first of why would combining hypertrophy work and strength work be an issue in the first place? Why couldn't we just get the best of both worlds? Because, you know, we need to answer that question. Well, there's kind of a theoretical component and a practical component. Theoretically, I think there are three components that make combining two different modalities or two different goals kind of difficult, right? You're not going to get the best of both worlds. Specifically, there's the component of molecular signaling. So if, for example, you look at the research of people trying to both gain strength, but also gain endurance, for example, trying to combine running and lifting weights, right? Something you find is that the signaling pathways involved in making you stronger and also giving you greater endurance can actually kind of sort of intersect. And if you do it both at the same time, you're not going to get the best of both worlds as far as actually molecularly what's happening. So at least on that level, there is an issue with combining different goals, training for different things at the same time. The second theoretical issue is time, right? Ultimately, for most people in the gym, there's only so much time you have to train. And so if you're trying to chase two things at the same time, and they're kind of pulling you in different directions, you might not have enough time to actually optimally achieve both, even if, say, you could if you had enough time. So for a lot of people, time is just a constraint. So power building will take away time from hypertrophy training and therefore give you worse hypertrophy results if you don't have enough time. And the final issue, theoretically, is fatigue. 
right? Fundamentally, you cannot recover from infinite training. Your body has certain systems in place that are, for example, impacted by your sleep, how much stress you have going on, what your nutrition is like, and so forth. And you can't just keep training, keep training, and recover and benefit from that training. And so even if you had enough time available, and even if there wasn't any molecular issues with combining two different goals, there is going to be a recovery issue wherein you couldn't just do all of your strength work, get maximum strength gains, and do all of your hypertrophy work and get maximum hypertrophy gains. Now, practically, these are theoretical issues but they haven't actually been studied much in relation to doing power building training. Like you'll find very few studies that actually look at power building protocols directly. So off the bat, we don't have perfect answers here. That's the truth. But we do have applied research where we actually do give people programs that somewhat combine strength work with hypertrophy work or that try and combine different goals. I think what we can look at is kind of breaking down your training into a few different variables, right? You talk about this a lot on your channel. There's exercise selection. There's how many reps you do per set. There's how many sets you do. There's a few variables that we're concerned with because they seem to be influential for how much strength you gain and how much muscle you gain. I'll kind of break them down and point out where the research suggests that there is a difference in how you should train to gain strength in the powerlifts versus how you should gain muscle. So the volume that you benefit from for hypertrophy and strength, as in number of hard sets per week per muscle group, let's just define it that way, is relatively similar for strength and hypertrophy. So you can see good, robust, close to optimal gains with similar volumes for strength and hypertrophy, but generally you will benefit from slightly higher volumes for hypertrophy. So you're giving up a little bit of gains there as far as hypertrophy goes, if you're choosing to go the powerlifting route or making some sacrifices in favor of powerlifting strength. The second thing is the movement patterns involved in power building, specifically the big three, although few power builders exclusively use this, aren't perfectly suited to hypertrophy training, but they do a decent job. And in fact, if you look at my area of research, which is range of motion, and that's a big way in which different exercises differ, right? There's not a huge effect of range of motion on hypertrophy. So even if you say you get 75% of a full range of motion of a full stretch by doing a powerlifting squat, as opposed to getting a full deep stretch, on each squat, you're missing out on some hypertrophy, but you might be talking about a couple percentage points. That's not a big difference. For people who don't care about getting 100% of their hypertrophy, we're not talking about a huge difference. But again, there is a slight trade-off there. As far as frequency goes, how often you train each muscle group, I think there's actually a lot or even entire overlap between strength and hypertrophy. If you see a lot of the best programs for hypertrophy and a lot of the best programs for strength, you're often talking about frequencies of two to four times a week maybe per muscle on average. And actually that's how you train for both strength and hypertrophy. So as far as frequency goes, pretty similar. Rest times, on the other hand, also kind of the same thing. You might see a benefit of slightly longer rest times with strength, just because you're more concerned with keeping weight on the bar set to set, because ultimately how heavy you lift for powerlifting is quite important. You want to have as high of an intensity as possible. Whereas for bodybuilding, just because your weight and or reps drops a little bit set to set, not as hugely influential. But broadly speaking, you don't want to be resting too short for either approach, and therefore a good deal of overlap once again. Now, let me talk about what isn't identical and what might cause more of an issue when trying to combine powerlifting and bodybuilding. Specifically, there is the rep range concern. When you're powerbuilding and you want to increase your strength in powerlifts, to be specific to powerlifting, you'll need to do some pretty low rep sets with pretty heavy weights. That isn't ideal for hypertrophy. The research we have comparing low rep ranges of as few as three reps per set to say 10 reps per set, closer to the sort of hypertrophy rep range, suggests it's a lot less time efficient and less fatigue efficient to do low rep sets. For example, we have a study comparing seven sets of three with three minutes rest to a group doing three sets of 10 with 90 seconds rest. And doing those seven sets of three with three minutes rest, that took them like across the whole session four or five times as much time, but in the end for the same hypertrophy as just doing three by 10. So clearly if the weight you're using is so heavy that you're getting three reps or generally less than five reps per set, you're sacrificing hypertrophy in terms of time efficiency. And in the study, at least, they also report higher fatigue and joint issues with heavier weights. And so if you're power building and a lot of your training is super heavy below five reps, you're likely training off some hypertrophy there. Not a huge issue, especially if most of your work is performed above five reps, but it's a concern nevertheless. The next thing is that the movements aren't optimal. As I just mentioned, the low bar squat, the bench, the deadlift, None of those movements are optimal for hypertrophy. Again, there's a few components like range of motion where you could still be tweaking things a little bit and getting a couple extra percentage points, but the research doesn't suggest a huge impact. We're talking about a few percentage points as far as hypertrophy is concerned. There is the concern of the positions involved may not optimally recruit certain muscles. For example, when you're low bar squatting, you might be shifting the emphasis more so to the hip extensors versus something like a high bar squat. And so there are issues there. The final bigger thing is that the RPE generally, so how close to failure you take a set, should be a little bit lower for strength work. We don't really see better strength gains when going closer to failure, but we do generally see more hypertrophy the closer to failure you go from a given set. And so if you're doing a ton of some maximal work, like I'm talking three plus reps in the tank and you're power building, those sets aren't maximally effective for hypertrophy. You're missing out on some gains there. But so 
broadly speaking, there is, I think, a lot of overlap in how you can train for hypertrophy to maximize that and how you can train for strength or powerlifting specifically. There are going to be some differences, but none of these variables play a huge role, at least within the context of what we were saying here. We're talking about a powerlifter maybe doing sets to RP7 versus a bodybuilder taking sets to RP9 or 10, a couple reps closer to failure. We're talking about a range of motion that's pretty solid, gets you some stretch, versus a range of motion that might get you more stretch, which based on the evidence, again, a few percentage points. But fundamentally, we're talking about potentially 80 to 90% of gains in strength and hypertrophy based on just the numbers we're seeing in this data. And we have dozens and dozens of studies overall. So that's where I'm coming at it from. And if you want to go to that anecdote route, you can see plenty of power builders and bodybuilders and powerlifters who are strong and big and all that, right? I don't think that tends to be the strongest form of evidence when we're trying to answer these questions because it's not controlled. Like, Ronnie Coleman was jacked and strong as shit. Is he the strongest powerlifter ever? No, but he got very strong. And Natty, he was stronger than pretty much all a lot of powerlifters, right? And so it's anecdotes tend to lead you astray. And then it's also a matter of, do you start box counting anecdotes? Like how many body rules got strong with this? Okay, well, that's basically science then, because then you're counting the number of anecdotes, or observations rather, and that is essentially starting to become science, but without the rigor of controlling for different variables. So anecdotes can lead you astray a little bit in this regard. So more importantly, while I'm all for maximizing one thing over the other, I'm all for if someone comes to me and is like, look, Milo, I just want to get jacked. Will I make them power up? Hell no. I'm going to make them bodybuild. I'm going to give them the best program to build size. Will that have some elements that overlap with a good power training routine? Absolutely. Can you make very solid gains in size and strength at the same time? Absolutely. You can make 80 to 90% of your gains, in my opinion, for both at the same time. That doesn't mean you can maximize both. Importantly, and this is not to be a defeatist at all, but I think that if you were to look at someone's training only and try to determine, okay, is your training really holding you back here? You couldn't actually tell all that well. Because often other things like genetics, PED use, etc., play a much larger role. And that's not to be a defeatist. I absolutely acknowledge that we want to optimize things. If someone came to me again and was like, look, I want to optimize, I would optimize things for them. But equally, let's not pretend that we're talking about someone making zero gains versus someone making all possible gains and ending up national level bodybuilder. So my TLDR, like if you didn't actually listen to any of this, I don't blame you. Paladin is a great way to get a good amount of both. I don't think it's an abomination. I think the evidence doesn't suggest that. I think there are certain concerns with combining both. That means you're not going to get the best of both worlds. And anyone telling you you'll get maximally strong and maximally big using a powerlifting approach, I have never claimed that. I'll never claim that because it simply doesn't seem to be true. But you can get great gains for both. And therefore, I don't think power building is an abomination if that's your goal. I have a lot of things to say about this. So first off, I think that anyone who has listened to my videos and listened to you, this actually pretty excellent summary of the entire question here, understands that we prematurely, meaning that this is my point. If your goal is pure hypertrophy, then you should train for pure hypertrophy. But then there are certain things that I heard in your discourse that I disagree with. And I think the point and the entire revolving door that is going to separate us in this debate is going to be this idea of specificity and also this idea that you can get 80 to 90%. I think that this is doable if you allow both size and strength to balance each other out and you don't let one take over the other. The issue is that this is not what I see. Meaning that there is this perfect idea of power building that exists as a concept, then there is the practice of it. And what I see in the practice of it is that naturally, certain movement patterns take over because they become a priority in your training. And these patterns tend to be the big three. So on paper, you're going to think to yourself, well, these movements will get me big. Because they will. If you get really strong at the bench press, I don't see why you wouldn't get bigger from it. But where the issue starts to arise is if the bench press starts to become such a priority that now your goal is to grow the bench press numbers at the detriment of the rest. I hear a lot of people who say, well, power building is essentially just getting as strong as possible for every single muscle. To me, that's not power building. To me, that's bodybuilding with a higher rep range and the goal of actually getting the entire body strong. When I look at people who power build, and I have many people who reach out to me, and you can say just anecdote, it absolutely is, what I see is an hyper focus on this trinity of the big three that then creates a vacuum where there's so much fatigue accumulated there that not much is done on the side. So if I look at the amount of people who, for example, skip abs or are going to skip entire muscle groups or even have this dislike or distaste for isolation, they tend to come from this power building background because they were taught, well, the compound movements is what gets you big. And that is the truth. It's going to get you much bigger to get stronger on the bench than on tricep isolation. But what they don't see is that the bench itself is a worse tricep builder when we look at actual fatigue accumulated in relation to a pure isolation for the tricep. So then you end up with a program that is 80% strength 
and 20 percent hypertrophy, which tends to produce physiques that I personally believe are unbalanced. I know that this is up to appreciation. Some people disagree with that. I know that this entire spider physique thing tends to piss people off. To me, a bodybuilder is defined by his arms. Because what you see in physiques, even people who have good jacked physiques, is that the part that tends to be lacking is the arms. And this is where we meet again at this revolving door where I disagree with you. You said at some point that the training should not necessarily be regarded as the reason why people don't have the physique that they want and that there are other factors. Absolutely, there are other factors. Some people have crazy tricep insertions, crazy good response, hypertrophic response for the bicep. They will grow for whatever. But many people don't have that. I didn't have that. The reason why I have big arms in relation to other people in the natural sphere is because I've always treated them as a priority. So when I see people with small arms and I get told, well, you cannot blame power building for that, I must disagree. I can absolutely blame it because I think that this is the reason for their imbalances. There is a reason why, and again, anecdote, most powerlifters, pure powerlifters, have crazy quads, quads for days, glutes for days, excellent chest, usually, but then you look at the arms and it's like, where is the development there? Well, it's not there because they don't need these muscles. These muscles are not prime movers. It would be a waste of time for them to develop them. That's fine for them. But if that same mentality starts to sip into power building training, which is what I've seen, then it becomes an issue because now you sacrifice aesthetic goals for efficiency at big three, but getting bigger at the big three, again, as you said, should only be 50% of your concern. But it's not 50% because strength is polarizing. If you try to train for both strength and size, you'll find that the one that is the most fatigue inducing and therefore requires you to pay more attention to your recovery is always going to be strength because strength is performance based. You see directly in the gym the result of your poor recovery if you don't do things properly. The same is not really true for size. So you're going to be inclined to prioritize strength because this is the one goal, the one performance oriented goal that is going to suffer the most if you don't pay attention to it size starts to lower and then you end up with something skewed and once you end up with this thing that i call the abomination then they claim that people can get 80 to 90 percent of their gains from that very concept that very practice i think is untrue you'll get 90 percent of your strength gains absolutely but you'll leave so many muscle groups to the wayside that they will be underdeveloped for years and this to me unless you decide or have convinced yourself that this type of physique is the best you can obtain to me that's not and this is why i say that many people if they just turn their back to this method would then finally see that their physique could reach a level that they would have never believed before where even if it's not purely hypertrophy that they pursue it'll still be better than what they would have gotten from a system that looks like at the big three as the main component of the entire concept so i wrote down your major arguments on both sides i'll quickly re-mention the points and we can go on from there addressing what is most important Milo talked about time constraints, fatigue, and how there's similar volumes for hypertrophy and power building. The movement patterns adequately develop the X-frame. There's similar frequency, same rest, and lots of muscular overlap. He also noted that anecdotes are not the best and that the evidence is not against power building. That differences are mostly a rep range concern, say comparing sets of three versus sets of 10 and going back to efficiency. And of course, there's the leverages of certain movements like low bar or just trying to optimize specificity, plus RPE and how it should be lower for strength training, which also plays into the time factor, but that most of one's hypertrophy potential would still be optimized. Then for natural hypertrophy, his main point is that strength is polarizing and that an overfocus on the big three generally causes spider physiques. And by extension, muscles that aren't the prime movers will not end up 80 to 90% developed. There's a distaste for isolation work and essentially, Physiques are defined by the arms, which usually end up lagging. In the real world, imbalances are almost inevitable. And that taking on a more bodybuilder approach has less risk by comparison, and you'll still get very strong in the end. So I think there's some agreements here, but that certain programming ideas and aesthetic expectations differ. The destination is important to underline too, because you all hear many people as a counter argument to the critique I have of power building say, well, if you want to bodybuild, you still have to get stronger. And no one denied that. Of course, it's a metric of performance and progression. You're going to have to get stronger. But the question is, how do you get stronger? And uh, I liked the rep range that you bring up, Milo, because I think it's, it's actually a very good example. You take two groups, one that does a three by 10 and one that does a, a seven, seven sets of three. 
Okay. First, I must say that seven sets of three is already sandbagging because if you're able to do the three reps with the three the same weight seven times in a row with no downgrade in performance, then your first sixth set was sandbagged. No wonder it's not going to get great results. Whereas the group that does a three by ten is much closer to failure. Now I don't know if the parameters were taken into account when it comes to failure in the study or not. You'll tell me that. But that to me makes sense, and I think that many people would see the three by ten as the superior option. And many people would also think of 3x10 as a bodybuilding quote-unquote rep range because it's high volume, which I agree with to an extent, but I could also absolutely see someone who power builds doing a 3x10. I don't think that's a counterindication. What do you think about that, Milo? By and large, I agree with you. Like, I think on rep range, we basically agree. I know in your original video, and in previous videos, actually, you recommended sets of as few as 3 reps. I think that's a bit too low, personally. Like, as I said, the evidence we have does suggest that if you go below, below about 5 reps, each set does become worse for hypertrophy. You need to do more sets overall to get the same hypertrophy in the end. But the rep range for hypertrophy is ultimately very non-specific. We can do sets of between five and like 50, five zero reps per set. As long as it's taken to failure, you might see similar hypertrophy. The issue with taking sets to super high reps, and this is something I want to bring up because you mentioned strength work might be a bit more fatiguing, right? Something I want to bring up is that actually when you look at the research, what you see is that generally the more reps you do per set, the more fatiguing the set becomes on a set per set basis, right? And that's obviously if you're taking both sets to failure, everything else is equated for, but higher rep ranges do typically cause more fatigue. And you can simply attribute that to you're doing more overall work. Generally, the more reps you do, the more energy you'll expend, the more resources and substrates you'll use up essentially. And so that's a factor. Coming back real quick to your argument around power building ultimately giving people spider physiques. I think your video should have been titled Power Builders are an abomination and not Power Building is an abomination. Now you might think that's semantics, right? But fundamentally, pretty much everything you're describing sounds to me like a qualm with how certain Power Builders are training, not with how Power Building can be approached. Because Power Building, fundamentally, I kind of defined it in very loose terms and very basic terms earlier, doesn't mean a whole lot. It can mean a variety of things. It's essentially on a spectrum from your training is perfectly hypertrophy optimized, but you do one single on deadlifts a week or one single on each main lift. That's still considered power building because ultimately you're training for both increasing strength and power lifts, but also hypertrophy. And depending on how you approach power building, I don't think it's an abomination at all. I just think it needs to be matched to the person's goals. If the person's goals are genuinely to get a decent physique, you know, maybe not a spider physique. I know people want to avoid that apparently. Um, but also get pretty strong. Maybe they do like 50-50 focus on both and they get a pretty solid physique and a pretty solid strength. They're not going to be as strong as they can be, not going to be the best they can be. But power building can absolutely work. Are some power builders in abomination? Yeah. And maybe they're misinformed if they think the power building is this one-way ticket to their best physique. Huge arms, because apparently that's the uh, main thing people gauge physiques by, which struck me as funny. The reason I say that is because it's perfectly fine to have your own sense of aesthetics. I think everyone does fundamentally, but I think that you need to clarify that up front if you're going to gauge the effectiveness of an approach based on how it conforms to your aesthetics, essentially. Because for example, like if we're taking more universal standards in bodybuilding and physique sports, the X frame is generally considered to be super important. Essentially, how broad are your shoulders, how small is your waist, and how large in terms of width are your legs, right? And arms don't really factor into that a whole lot. So it really comes down to your sense of aesthetics. Now, powerlifting still won't give you the best X frame ever. Like that's not the, the argument here. But I'm saying that you need to definitely clarify your position on aesthetics because it ultimately plays into what you think is optimal to a large extent. Another thing I want to touch on real quick is depending on how you power build, you can get a solid amount of both. The important thing as well is that while I mentioned that if you were just training for max strength in the next few months, or if you were just training for maximum hypertrophy in the next few months, there are some differences, as I outlined in a sort of opening statement. But equally, in the longer term, getting bigger, building more muscle, is a huge part of becoming a strong powerlifter. Now, that doesn't mean getting bigger biceps, and I think we're both aware of that. Like, no powerlifter out there is maxing out their bicep curls 20 sets a week to get huge arms because it's going to improve their bench. But it does mean improving their size in the main movers. And I think, especially if they're competing or maxing out on a pretty infrequent basis, that might mean that they're spending 10 months a year pretty much optimizing hypertrophy, especially for the main movers, but to a large extent getting solid gains in other movers as well, like the biceps or what have you. And so I think that depending on the approach you use, 
power building isn't an abomination, but some power builders are an abomination, especially if you're avoiding or trying to avoid that dreaded spider physique. Milo makes a lot of good points. So in order, and I'm not taking notes, so I'll do it by memory, but first... I think that the cementing component of the debate is interesting. It will bore people to death. But I must say personally that, to me, there is a difference between the concept and who embodies it. So an example I have is you have the concept of Christianity, then you have Christians. And the two are not the same. So if you meet Christians, unless they tell you they're Christians, you might not even be able to know that. So I think that just brushing the entire thing under the rug by saying, well, you're talking about concepts here, it's just semantics, is fine, it's fair, but it also is not the way we interact with reality. When I interact with reality, I interact with Christians, not Christianity. I interact with power builders, not power building. So your point that I should have named the video power builders are an abomination is absolutely correct. But considering the amount of hate I got for the original title, I think that it's best if I step on eggs for a bit. Number two was this notion of fatigue. And we'll get back to the notion of fatigue before, but I'm certain that we'll understand here that you have one bucket of fatigue and that is your body. So whether you train for strength or for size, the same bucket is being emptied. You take from the same well. And so if you do, for example, what you said, someone who maxes out uh, like on the, the power lift once a week, yeah, it looks like nothing on paper, but a, an actual genuine one rep max is going to tire you out and that is fatigue that is going to impede the rest of the program. If I have you max out on deadlift on Wednesday, you're not doing any hypertrophy work for your legs on Thursday or Friday. Like, I can sign you that. Maybe you'll be recovered by Saturday, maybe. But I see this as a reoccurrence in a program that on one occurrence is not that bad at all. But if it is something that happens every single cycle, is going to be an issue. And talking about cycle, you pointed out that someone, a power builder who would spend 80% of their time training for hypertrophy would have tremendous results. And I absolutely agree, but I also think that this is not what we see because every time I see an hybrid athlete and I look at their programs, again, anecdote, what I see is large and long strength blocks as it should be because you have to have time to actually peak, you have to have, to have time to temper and deload. And then I see maybe two months of hypertrophy block if we're lucky. And anyone who trains for hypertrophy knows that two months isn't going to do much, especially if these two months are the only time of the year where you train certain muscle groups. Because the powerlifter, someone who wants to get better at the powerlift, who dedicates time to forearms, for example, is a bad powerlifter. Because this is a literal waste of time. But for a bodybuilder, it's not. And this is the reason why you then see the result in the real world where a bunch of people have small forearms. And this is me going further. You never said that yourself, but who then try to justify it with genetics by saying, well, it was just meant to be. I think that's nonsense. I think it's the reason of poor methodology. And this is what we're here to discuss today. It goes back to the training versus methodology and also power builder versus power building. And NH clarified that with the Christianity versus Christian argument. Where the disagreement lies is regarding which muscles are most important for a physique athlete. Milo was talking about the X frame and the idea of fatigue. And then the programming itself, NH mentioned the hypertrophy block specifically, that there's less of them compared to the strength phases. So therefore, it's going to be skewed in the direction of having better pound for pound strength, for example. But maybe the prime movers for the big three will be maximally developed because the specificity was just directed in that way. So I guess it boils down to the training itself. You have to address what exactly it is, you know, like what is power building training? Are higher reps more fatiguing or is it the one rep maxes and then everything that follows after that point and the emphasis on certain movement patterns? Like what is causing these differences? I think that this would be the perfect time before Milo steps in for you, Alex, to actually tell us a little bit about your experience because the reason why we, Milo and I, believe that you would be the perfect person to actually hold this debate is because you've done both. You're someone who is a monster on general strength, crazy pull-ups, crazy dips, crazy bench, a four-plate bench is insane at your body weight, and you've done bodybuilding. And you, I think you won. You won your category, right? I got second place, but I did it self-coached, and I was uh, with guys who were repeat competitors. So I forfeited my right to go with the novices. So I think I did pretty good. I can definitely say there were differences in the last two years or so for me doing more power building kind of training to pure-ish bodybuilding, though I still have a general strength bias. Based off my experience, it was really the arms that were lagging. And I found that certain aspects of the back were not being developed. Like I found that my spinal rectors got insanely thick, my lats, not the same treatment, and the traps. You run into the issue of the stimulus fatigue ratio. So I'll 
I'll just sum it up like this, right? When you deadlift past 500 pounds for reps, that takes a long time. So I don't think you're saving any time just off that. And there's so much fatigue generated on a separate set basis that you're better off doing something that is more hypertrophy focused, like an RDL or a good morning. In my experience of making the switch, it allowed me to actually deadlift 600 pounds without even training the lift. So low specificity, I just hypertrophied the primary movers, focus on other hip hinges that was not conventional dead or sumo. Lo and behold, I was able to pull more, but me training more so to raise my deadlift didn't have the same effect on my physique is what I'm trying to say. Regarding the bench press, I built up to a 405 bench at 185 body weight. I even did a 380 close grip bench. And I was told for years that if I just get my pressing numbers strong enough, I'm going to have massive triceps. They're going to mog everybody. And yet there were people who didn't even bench three plates who already had 17 plus inch arms. And I, I found that it never made sense. So my arms peaked at 16 and a half. I switched over to complete bodybuilding training, got them up to 17. And then shortly after with some more bodybuilding training, 17.2. Yet my bench press did not budge an inch. It's the exact same. My close bench is the same. However, my isolation strength went up tremendously. So my dumbbell extensions went from like 40 pounds per hand to 60 pounds each hand. So there was a 20 pound increase on isolation strength, which represented a direct increase in muscle size in my triceps. And I can say the same thing for weighted chin-ups, which is not a powerlifting argument, but this is more of a calisthenics perspective, that getting to four plates as a one rep max, my arms were barely over 16 inches. So I got really, really strong at two of the best compound movements that everyone swears will get you huge, including on weighted dips. I did five plates and my arms are my worst body part, next to calves, of course. That's the bias that I have against that. However, I would absolutely state that it worked wonders for my chest, worked wonders for my legs, so quads, glutes, all that. And I would venture to say that like when I compete in bodybuilding, my legs were just as good as everyone else on stage. And I'm probably the only guy who built it with free weights only. You can't go wrong with focusing on the big three. But other areas, I think the delts are a big one, to be honest. I've seen a lot of power lifters or power builders who don't have 3D action. And it's not because they need to do more lateral raises on the side, because oftentimes they do. It's the fact that they have this imbalance between vertical pressing strength and horizontal, in the sense that they can have a 315 bench and not be able to overhead press their body weight. Or they can have an elite bench being 350 to 405, yet only overhead press 225. And that was me. I also had an imbalance between my incline pressing strength and my flat benching strength by 90 pounds. So I did a 315 incline and a 405 flat. Why? Because of all the years of emphasizing the flat barbell bench press. So specificity played a role in the long-term strength outcome, but it also affected my net physique and the general strength. So I think there's a few areas, because it's always a hip hinge and a squat, your legs are gonna get huge. And for the, the, just the flat pressing, you're gonna get massive pecs, but your delts might be lagging behind. Then the arms are just a no-go. I've also seen some deadlifters who can pull 600, 700 pounds, who their backs is surprisingly one of their worst body parts, which might sound shocking, but the deadlift is the most leverage dependent out of the big three. And we've all seen these dudes who are just putting up crazy numbers and they got no width going on. Whereas if we look at the calisthenics world, you'll never find a street lifter who is not wide. And I feel like that is not emphasized enough a vertical movement pattern. Everyone talks about doing their deadlifts, but there's not enough emphasis on the other movement patterns, whether it be rows or pull-ups or any of that stuff. So I think it's it's not just about the X frame. We gotta look at these other areas that really bring out the rest of your physique, going beyond the base muscle. But I would say that just being generally strong will probably give you 70%. What do you think about that? I think it makes a lot of sense. I do think that some of the issues you might've experienced could have potentially been remedied. And again, this comes back to the whole idea that power building is a concept and how you choose to approach it defines what you're going to get out of it a lot more than a blanket statement around power building. But let me get back to some of the stuff NH said first. The first thing is, let me just hit off, use the Christianity analogy. I think it's a fine analogy. The issue with that line of reasoning, in my view, I do think in general you have a point, by the way, but I think there is an issue with that line of reasoning. And that is that if you're trying to get an idea of what a concept is like through the representatives or through the embodiment of that concept, right? Like, for example, Christians for Christianity. The issue there is that you don't necessarily have a representative sample of the concept. Let's say, for example, you've gone outside twice in your life, right? Like you're a basement dweller and live in your basement and you've gone outside twice and you've seen a couple Christians and they were terrible people. And therefore, if you went by this method, you're like, Christianity is awful, right? And that's the issue with anecdotes in general is that you're not necessarily dealing with a representative or large enough sample for it to be representative of the whole population or a whole concept in this case. And so with power building, I think that can happen where like, shit, man, I got power builders I hate as well. You know, like I can name them, you know, but that doesn't mean I hate power building. Uh, no, no, no. Hey, let's not go in that direction. Um, 
So I think that's a fair point, but I just think that we need to look at the concept more directly versus only relying on the the people. And by the way, to your credit, I think that if you're releasing a video with the intent to inform some misinformed and to guide some misguided people who think that power loading is this great approach to get all your hypertrophy, maybe you did some good in the end with the title and with people getting people in and they were like, they had bad physiques and now they think, huh, maybe I should stop this power building stuff because it's not getting me those uh, huge arms that NH has. So that's one thing. I do think the point that doing a max out, and I don't necessarily mean a max out, by the way. I mean, literally just a heavy single could be fine, like RP8, RP9, RP10, whatever you want. It will cause some fatigue, absolutely. But the evidence we have comparing like lower rep sets, even taken to failure, so I'm talking like a max out, versus higher rep sets, also taken to failure in this case, or submaximal or not, we have research comparing all of that. It just doesn't suggest that doing a single before a session, for example, is really going to meaningfully fatigue you for the rest of the session or for the next day. Now, there will be an effect if you're doing five sets of five, RP8, warming up for heavy squats, then doing bench afterwards, that'll have an effect. But if you're approaching power loading as a method with a slight strength bias and picking your battles right, if you apply it right, honestly, I think it can work out really well. I think absolutely some power blows take it the wrong way and they don't balance their programs right in terms of their priorities. But again, more of an issue with practitioners versus the method. I think this is evidenced, for example, by powerlifters who literally squat three or four times a week and they might do like five sets pretty like RP8 every session and come back the next day and do the same thing. And they're fine. And that's a sport where performing your best each session is actually pretty important because how much weight you load on the bar is directly going to influence how much of a strength stimulus you get from that session. And so when we're talking about hypertrophy, where here's a hot take, recovery doesn't need to be optimal. Just because you're not perfectly recovered for a session doesn't mean you can't go into the gym and get a very solid hypertrophy effect from that session. So even if you do get a little bit of fatigue from doing, say, a single to start your session, you can still stimulate growth extremely effectively for the rest of that session. You might not get 100% because, again, there is a trade-off, and I think that's kind of what we'll come back to eventually every time with any of these lines of reasoning, but it might not be that large, and I think you can get solid gains again. I think one thing Alex pointed out with the good morning example where for years he was kind of stuck below a 600-pound deadlift, and eventually he focused on good mornings, which are less specific. And lo and behold, he grew some muscle and deadlifted 600 pounds. I think that's an example and an, uh, an illustration of the fact that one, in the long term, gaining muscle is going to be key for maximizing your strength. And if the way Alex was approaching programming wasn't maximizing his long-term growth of the main movers, hamstrings, glutes, etc., of the deadlift, that might have been holding him back. And I think that illustrates that with specificity, you have diminishing returns. Once you've got like half of your training is like low bar squatting and benching, etc., you're not going to get many additional strength gains by doing all of your training as low bar squats and what have you, right? And so that actually opens the door for power building to be reasonably effective because you don't need to be perfectly specific and because there are diminishing returns to how specific you are for strength and how much of an improvement you'll see. And so actually you could just do, you know, 50 to 80% of your work hypertrophy optimized, you know, in the right rep ranges, the right movements, etc., and maybe 20 to 50% as strength work. And you might, and I know Alex at 70%, I'm going to stand by 80 to 90%, and you honestly might get super solid gains in both. That is my honest expectation because there are diminishing returns. And sometimes, like Alex just explained, focusing on hypertrophy can actually directly improve your strength. And so they can kind of complement each other, right? You do some hypertrophy work, it makes you bigger, and then you do some specific work, and it kind of, it teaches you how to use that muscle. And it works beautifully. Does it optimize either? No. That's kind of my, what we ultimately will end up at. But I think good programming can go a long way to remedy some of the issues that you have with power building or the way some power builders rather apply this concept. Yeah, and I think this is, if the viewers take anything from this video, it should be this. Because what Milo said encapsulates the two concepts that matter here. And that is the recovery aspect and the specificity aspect. A lot of people will say that hypertrophy work and bodybuilding work is easier than strength work. And in a sense, they're right. But what they should mean is it's less fatiguing or it's less specifically fatiguing in that you now have the entire body as a sponge to accumulate that fatigue. And so it's perfectly true that if you do it properly, you come in and you hit that one specific lift that you train for strength, and then you complement that day with all the patterns for all the muscle groups in hypertrophy work, you should not see any diminishing returns. You should not see any performance hindrance. You should be absolutely able to do all of that work. That is, if you actually also apply what Alex was speaking about, which is this disregard for specificity. Specificity is the best way to get stronger at a lift. If you want to get bigger, a bigger bench press, you bench press. But eventually you reach a point where this stops working. And then you start to tap into all of this hypertrophy work, all of these variations and accessories, etc. The point is that as a bodybuilder and someone who wants to train for hypertrophy, you should not wait or you should not even allow the bench press to get to that point. You should start 
with this more split method. You should already have your quote unquote accessories, which should really not be accessories. And I speak as someone who made that mistake for years, my main hip hinge was the deadlift. Years and years and years, until it budged. I couldn't get past 500 pounds. Then what did I do? I started to look outside of the box and started to do other movements to grow the deadlift. Five years later, I'm at a point where now the deadlift is an accessory for me. It's an accessory for my RDL. When my RDL plateaus, I get back to deadlifting, I increase my three rep max and my RDL gets up. This is the split, the difference in perspective between someone who trains for strength, someone who trains for size, which is, and Alex, I'm certain you're going to be all over this one, interesting to think about because if you look at the sphere of powerlifting and strength sports in particular, there is a name and that name is Louis Simmons. And Louis Simmons' method, interestingly enough, is also the closest strength method to bodybuilding because if you just change small parameters to it, you have an hypertrophy program because Simmons used to preach and used to claim that it was a bad idea to be over-specific and to hammer a lift all the time. So he would have people rotate variations and train the good morning, for example, because he said that if you grow your good morning, your deadlift is going to blow up as well. It's also sort of the, the approach I have. It's just that the end result that I'm looking at as someone who teaches people how to get better at hypertrophy is going to be that this plethora of variations and this disregard for specificity will get you stronger, yes, as a byproduct, but it also will make you much, much bigger down the line. What you're saying is you'll still be strong if you focus on hypertrophy. The net result is like you can approach competitive powerlifter numbers despite not being a power builder. Yet the other way around, you can end up with a lagging physique comparatively. Yes, also, I just want to make absolutely clear that I'm not claiming here that my method is good for strength or a revolution for strength. I'm saying that if you're looking for something that resembles that, listen to Alex or listen to Louis Simmons. And the idea is to start with this accessory variation from the get-go, not that you need to be specific for all these years. And then once you have the plateau, you switch over. Okay, so what do you think about that, Milo? Using variations of the big three from day one, still wanting to get stronger long-term, but you're not specific from the start. Yeah, so I actually agree with natural hypertrophy here. I think that if you're being super specific from day one and you persistently only ever remain specific, you're probably shooting yourself in the foot as far as strength goes. Even. Building bigger prime movers in the long-term is going to be a key part of making you the strongest power lift you can possibly be. And so if you only ever consider specificity as the main principle, even as a powerlifter, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And I actually want to touch on something that I think natural hypertrophy and myself agree on here. And that is, there has been, on occasion, I don't think this is as pervasive anymore, but there has been on occasion the advice given that you need to build a base first. That you need to get stronger before you can graduate on to hypertrophy work. And there is no basis for that. It's just... In an online space that used to be, I think, a lot more powerlifting centric, it was just the advice given. But like, if my mom started lifting, which unfortunately she doesn't yet, would I make her do the squat bench deadlift to build a base first? Hell no. I would make her do machine-based work and just lift some weights and get the health benefits and build muscle. Like, you don't need to build a base first. That doesn't mean anything. It's just made up, essentially, and just the preference of coaches who have had a powerlifting background their whole lives. And so I actually agree with you on that. I think that you don't need to build a base. I think if you're someone who doesn't quite know what they want yet, then maybe an approach like you're describing where you do some specific work for the squat bench deadlift, but you also do a lot of non-specific work, is a great approach. Because you can get, kind of get a taste for both, right? You can taste powerlifting and be like, oh, I like the squat bench deadlift, or I don't like it. And then after a few months, you will have learned the basic technique on those on your with a coach or what have you, and you'll have had experience with hypertrophy training, and then you'll know what direction you want to go in. But it is absolutely bullshit that you need to build a base first. So I actually agree with you there. I'm glad you said that because unfortunately, it's still a prevalent myth. I still have people who come to my channel, they see my novice programs and they say, oh, I'll be back in six months after I run starting strength. Why would you need to run starting strength before doing my program? My program has all the same patterns. It's just that you're, I'm not going to kill you by having you do the movements three times a week. The, rep, the reprint is going to be relevant. You won't be sandbagging. You're not going to get overused injuries on low bar squat. And you're going to be free. And I think this is also what I hate so much about what I consider power building is that it's the form of dogma where people follow it and they don't quite know why. So if you tell them, okay, why are you bench pressing and not doing push-ups, weighted push-ups? 
Many people can't answer that. I'm certain, and this is up in the air, maybe one day you'll run a study like this. I'm certain that if you compare the total volume accumulated for lifters in a specific county of the US, and you looked at the type of horizontal pattern, horizontal press pattern that they used, you'd see that it's disproportionately directed towards bench press. But there's no reason for that, because the bench press is not superior to a dip, it's not superior to a push-up. So it's coming down directly to just culture. It's the gym culture of people saying how much you bench, or noobs coming into the gym and the only movement they know for the chest is the bench, so they end up doing that. But that might not be the best option for them. Then they get funneled into this idea, oh, just get a bigger bench press, you'll have a massive chest. It might work, it should work, but for some people, it simply won't because the bench is simply not the best movement for them. They might not even like it that much. And what you said about picking your battle is relevant in this case. Picking your battle and picking your exercises and what you like to do should be the first thing you do when you get into the gym. But because novices don't know much, they just jump onto the first program they see and these programs tend to have picked up battles for them. So my point is that if we open people's eyes and minds, more importantly, and we make them realize that, hey, there is nothing special about these three lifts, you don't have to build a base on them, we will see better physique down the line. I put my bank account on that. I think it's the fact that novices start off with these power building programs that are rather minimalist in nature, that when they become intermediate, they continue training that way and they make their imbalances worse because they still think that they're building their base when it's already been established. And in reality, they never really had to focus so much on those things to begin with. At the end of the day, it goes back to the gym culture being a motivation. And that's one of the points that uh, Milo made in his response video, that because there's these strength standards, that it might make one more motivated to pursue hitting big weights. And as a result, they'll end up getting massive in the process. Yeah, so I made that point. I do think that going back to the example of the bench being used in a lot of gyms across the world, ultimately behaviors are an outcome of a variety of factors. That could be what you see other people do, so sort of norms that you see in the gym around you. It could be an outcome also of tradition or of sort of what people have done for a long time or the programs that are around. There's a lot of things that go into influencing behavior. Likewise, there are a lot of things that go into influencing motivation. Right? Like there's a whole field of research dedicated to motivation. Are you intrinsically motivated by what you're doing? Do you just enjoy doing it and that's why you do it? Are you extrinsically motivated? Are you doing it because someone's paying you or because you want to look better? You're more motivated by an outcome. I think that social comparison, which is a thing in research as well, where you're essentially comparing your own strength or your own performance to other people, is a means to get more motivated. Right? Is it the best means? Absolutely not. But when you're comparing two movements, and I used the example of the hack squat in the original video, like to say, yeah, most people don't care about reaching specific hack squat standards. And actually, that might have not been the best example because there's been a renaissance lately, especially in the UK, actually, of people being like, yep, I'm hitting six plates per side on the hack squat. And people are loving it for some reason. But like for a lot of movements, especially isolation movements, there aren't really a lot of strength standards out there. And so for a beginner who may not necessarily have the motivation in place yet to just be like, I love going to the gym. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I could be doing push-ups. doesn't matter if anyone else is doing that exercise. I'll just go to the gym anyways because I'm motivated to do it. But for someone who's new to the gym and who might need an extra push or something to aim for or something to motivate them like an outcome initially, who are not fully bought into the process yet, maybe having some standards or some people to compare themselves to is a good thing. Now I hear you saying, well, maybe them pursuing that goal isn't such a good thing because by using the squat, bench, and deadlift, maybe they're going for hypertrophy, but they see other people doing it and they pursue it anyways and they don't get their best hypertrophy as a result. And I would agree with that. But then it becomes a matter of weighing up, do we value them actually going to the gym by being more motivated and thus actually doing the damn thing? Or do we value them really optimizing and fine-tuning their exercise selection to get those last few percentage points? Personally, I think for a lot of people, especially beginners, we want the former. Another thing I wanted to address, when we're talking about people getting funneled into these strength programs, I think there's some truth to that. But I also think we're talking about a very hyper-specific niche that we all happen to operate within. We're talking about the freaks here. You know, we're all talking about five, 600 pound deadlifts. So we've kind of been there, done that, right? Um, a lot of people get into the gym and don't even know what starting strength are. They just pick some random machines that they see people use and they're like, yeah, this looks pretty non-intimidating. Let me just use this. As much as many people end up being quote unquote funneled into the, those programs to begin with, I think a lot of people get funneled the other way around as well. So I think we're typically addressing those people who have been funneled into those strength programs. So I absolutely acknowledge the importance and the validity of speaking about these matters on this podcast, but I don't want us to lock the door in our echo chamber all too much, if that makes sense. Yeah, and also not to take anything away from the work of the people who actually promoted these programs, because to be absolutely clear, coming into the gym and doing bench squat deadlift will always trump 
some guy who just comes from the street and does lat pull downs with like RP7 every single day of his life, which I've seen, and that will get you no result whatsoever. That is an absolute certainty. But I think our job as educators and influencers in the fitness sphere is to create a better culture for people, where maybe one day we'll get people who will be excited about getting a 10 rep max on the easy bar curl, and then we'll see much bigger biceps. It'll take a long time, and I don't, I'm not even certain it'll ever happen, but I hope it does, because that's not the culture that I see. Whenever I see people who train seriously in the gym, it's always with the big compounds, and it's always the same compounds. Now, I absolutely understand that it's better for them to do that than to do just random machine work, and strength standards, something that I personally do not like, participate in that. Because men are ego-driven, we want to be stronger than the next guy, so we're going to get onto that road, and that road will also make us bigger down the line. But maybe one day, instead of a big three, we'll be talking about a big 10, or a big 12, where every single movement pattern is represented, and, well, people will actually get much bigger from that. I think it goes back to beginners, because that's where all this confusion is coming from. Because... You can be a novice for one to two years, but after that, you're in intermediate territory and your program is going to have to change. And what you started off with can affect the rest of your journey. And I think that's where guys have trouble breaking away. So it's like on one end, we have the beginners who come in. They're just using a bunch of random machines. They don't know what they're doing. So we funnel them into power building ideologies, right? And it works for them because now they're actually focusing on the basics with proper intensity, proper progression, etc. But then you have those other people who they get so sucked into it that now they lose their identity as a bodybuilder. And now they're going to carry through that for the next coming years, even though they're way past the beginner stage. So I guess it's like, when should we move away and do what we actually want instead of just trying to cater because people have trouble being motivated or adhering to a certain philosophy? Yeah. And that's where I see, not to lump you guys in with me, what I'm seeing here. That's where I see our role by and large. And that's sort of educating people as to, hey, if you want this outcome, this is what you should be doing. Right. And making people think about, okay, what's the best way to get there? I think that's where ultimately our roles as YouTubers comes in a lot is obviously as entertainment. I don't think we neatly fit into that category. I think all of us talk about what's the best approach to get bigger biceps in this case. Right. And so I think it's up to us to an extent to be like, hey, look, you may or may not think power building is a decent approach overall. But if you want to maximize hypertrophy, this is what you should do. This is what I think you should do. I think the shift away from those main lifts is going to take a while. And by the way, I don't think those the squat bench deadlift are the worst exercises ever for people to start out with. I think, in fact, for someone like, cool, when you start training, yeah, you'll have the odd super motivated individual who will start training five days a week, six days a week, and be like, I, I love this already. Like, this is incredible. But for a lot of people, it's like, ah, might start training three times a week. In reality, they end up going like once or twice a week. So when they go, they might just be incentivized to, listen, just make those sessions count. We don't care about optimizing the SFR for the quads or the calves or the forearms here or the biceps. We just care about stimulating most of the muscles in your body that you probably care about, or potentially even just delivering the health benefits of lifting. And in that case, the squat bench deadlift, they happen to be some of the most multi-jointed or compound movements that are out there, right? Like they involve stabilization of the spine. Very cool thumbs up. I'm not sure what happened. They happen to involve stabilization of the spine. They happen to involve extension of the hips, extension of the knees. A lot of muscle groups are involved. And so for a single movement, you're getting stimulus, maybe not the optimal stimulus, and maybe not the minimal fatigue that we're after, but you're getting a solid effect for a lot of muscle groups at once. So as far as time efficiency goes for beginners, it's a pretty solid gateway. I don't think we should be advertising it as being like, you must do these. And I think none of us on this call certainly do that. And I think our role is to be like, look, there's probably better exercises out there. But equally, let's not pretend this is a plague within the fitness industry or an abomination necessarily. I would argue that the Black Plague came and went, meaning that it used to be. It used to be that you would be berated if you refused to do conventional deadlift. You would be berated if you didn't want to squat with a straight bar. It's getting better. I think we're moving away from that. Like you said, I'm glad to hear that people are starting to take hack squat seriously because I think it's a movement that even as a beginner, you're going to be able to use immediately. But now we are starting to get into the discussion of minimalism versus maximalism. And I also absolutely agree that for novices, there is really no point in trying to optimize their training to a T because this actually might be the reason why they quit. And we see that all the time. I sort of pointed towards that. I'm not saying you do that, Milo, but what I'm seeing a lot from the science-based crowd 
is this tendency to try and optimize every single thing. Oh, don't do this lat pull down, do this one with this angle because it's slightly better for the lat. That might be great for us because we already have built a lot of mass in that area. But for someone who's new, I mean, look at the amount of people who use biomechanics to, tr to try and proclaim that pull-ups are suboptimal or that they don't train the lats. This is horrible to hear as a beginner because a pull-up is a million times more fun than an iliac pull-down with an angle and a knee. Who wants to do that? Who gets hyped to do that? It's a genuine question. So this is where minimalism triumphs. Yeah, do your big compounds when you get started. And if that's the only time that you have for the day, you have 45 minutes, sure, you can skip some isolation, but you'll get to a point, and we could call this this intermediate stage, where this will no longer cut it where if you want to progress, you're going to have to maximize a bit more and suddenly like your training expands, but you know, bit by bit. Even someone like me, like me, who is advanced in bodybuilding, there's a ton of things I don't maximize. For example, leg training. I don't do any leg extension. I don't train my doctors directly because I don't see the need right now. My legs still grow fine right now. There will come a day where I will be able to use this space I'm not using right now to expand and to grow more. But I perfectly understand that if someone is doing good results and doing just fine and having fun in the gym, they might not want to go down that route and that's okay. So it goes back to minimalism hype and how the squat bench press deadlift are not the worst lifts to start off with. The stimulus to fatigue ratio doesn't really matter for beginners. And at the end of the day, these big heavy compounds are absolutely time efficient at the start. But once you do have some strength, yeah, it, it changes a bit. But trying to optimize these little factors becomes more relevant for guys like us, but maybe not necessarily who we're speaking to at this current time frame. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that when you first start lifting, as you mentioned, we're talking about a few percentage points between the SFR of like a squat with lower positioning versus higher positioning. And that's absolutely relevant when you're advanced. You're worried about either not making gains anymore or making like some gains and continuing the journey. But when you first started lifting, I think for a lot of people, and I think the evidence-based fitness space is absolutely responsible for this, by the way, to a large extent. But that also means there's kind of a need for it or demand for it of people wanting to know what's the best. What can we, how can we arrive at the best approach? Here? And that's to an extent also who you speak to, because, you know, I've seen some of your content, like a tier list of what are the best techniques and stuff. And ultimately tier lists are also about like, what's the best way to get more jacked here? And so I think there is a need and a demand for this in the market. But I think within the science-based space, the real key comes from being like, look, yes, I think length and partials, that's my PhD, by the way, always speak about it. Length and partials might offer you more hypertrophy than a four range of motion. But we're not talking about like doubling your hypertrophy. We're talking about like potentially like an extra 5% or something, you know, like we're not talking world changing. And I'm never, as someone who is trying to be a genuine communicator in the space, I won't be like, this is killing your gains, right? Like I might be like, is it killing your gains? And then be like, nah, it's not killing your gains. But I think that it's our responsibility to contextualize this stuff. So the people who are new to lifting and who are like, oh, I just want to enjoy training. And then you see a video by natural hypertrophy or by Milo Wolf or whatever. And he's like, it's killing your gains. And then you're like, ah, oh, shit, now I need to change my training. And then you change your training again and you change your training again. And you're very confused and you're not enjoying the process anymore and you quit lifting. That's what we want to avoid. But I think that educating people as to what works well, as long as we're being genuine and transparent about it. And that's where I know we all have to fight this battle of not just engaging in mindless clickbait, trying to maintain a sense of integrity, but equally trying to tap into the algorithm a little bit, right? It's, it's a fickle battle, really. But that's where we come in, and that's what we got to do. But I absolutely agree that minimalism can help out a lot when you're first starting out, because when you get into a hobby, and ultimately, let's be real, unless you're competing in bodybuilding and you want to make your living off of it, lifting is a hobby for a lot of people, right? It's even a hobby for me, even though I functionally live off this. When you're first getting into a hobby, you don't need to know every detail. You don't need to be a maximalist. You can be a minimalist, and in fact, it will probably serve as a better gateway into the process than being a maximalist off the, off the dome. So that's how I see it. But I think we agree on this anyways, to be honest. Yeah. And you tap also into something that's interesting and maybe we can discuss it a bit at some point, but there's also this algorithmic demand for content that is going to pretend to be the best. And let's not pretend that we don't know that. We know it. We know how the human spirit works. Every influencer knows that. If I make a video called, I think this method might be okay, sort of, who's going to click that? No one. But if I say this is the best, with best in capital letters, best method for hypertrophy, dot, 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 it's going to be a hit. Is the content of the video genuine? No, of course not, because we all know that this method doesn't exist. It's case by case, individual by individual. But we, and I, I include the three of us, we who make good content have to compete with Muppets 
who make garbage information. And these guys have no qualm or integrity whatsoever. They will clickbait every single time. And if we refuse to clickbait, we lose. Because it means that our information gets less visibility, and so we get less people down the right path. So that's one thing. And then to sort of touch also on this idea of minimalism and maximalism again, what I see a lot, and this is also what prompted my video personally, is people who engaged down that path of minimalism via the big three, for example, and who got great gains from it, and eventually they store their plateau or their physique is not what they would want which is fine, at which point they should divert and they should expand. But they failed to do that because they bought into the idea that what they were doing at the start was the best and that if they want to get better results, they just need to keep going, keep getting stronger on these patterns and then magically it will happen. And that's what Alex was experiencing and what I've heard as well in the, in the space, which is, oh, if you hit that amount of X on X compound movement, this muscle group will be big, guarantee you. We know it doesn't work like that. But I've seen people and I've dealt with people who are stuck in that mindset and they couldn't let go of it. And these are the people that I call the strength coppers, where they train for strength, hoping that magically one day size will arise. And what we do, what we should be doing is to tell them, no, no, pick a movement pattern that actually recruits that muscle group in priority and get strong on that. Why would you want... Or why would you even attempt to get a byproduct when you could get the final product by just focusing on it? It's like if I met someone trying to get better at chess and to be better at chess, they played checkers, thinking, oh, it'll carry over one day. Just, no, just do chess. Do chess theory openings, play chess games, you'll get better at chess. Ultimately, that is the point of optimal training. It's optimal for your goals. So I think that there's, again, the blame does lie on a lot of people spreading ultimately misinformation. The factors that underlie strength or how strong you are on a given lift are multifactorial. Hypertrophy and how big a given muscle is absolutely plays a role. However, I think the reason why people love saying, just hit a four plate bench, bro, you'll be massive. It's a very quantifiable outcome. You know, like all you need to do is just pursue this one practical goal and you'll get to the outcome that ultimately we have less of a means to measure, right? Like we can measure arm size and what have you, but it's a bit less more nebulous to quantify muscle size. And so if we just tell you, keep chasing that four plate bench and eventually you get there, there is some truth to that, right? There is a correlation between how much muscle you have and how strong you are. But because a lot of these people, I think, lack the scientific wherewithal knowledge, whatever, to understand that size isn't the only thing that contributes to strength, and in fact, even if you don't have the scientific will with all, just spend a day in a gym. In a good gym, you'll see, as Alex said earlier, you'll see people pulling 600 pounds and their legs might be 20 inches, right? Like their quad circumference. And it's like, ah, maybe strength isn't just directly, perfectly correlated to size. There's other factors like pination angle of muscle fibers, technique, like a lot of other things that can contribute. And so I think that it's ultimately just down to the people who have been spreading this stuff. I have never really told someone like who came to me look, saying like, look, I want bigger arms. What do I do? I've never been like, bro, just get six plates on the chin up and, you know, everything will be solved. That's the worst advice. Much better advice is here's how to program for this movement to get the best gains. That's a much better answer. Ultimately, to come back to the thumbnail and like titling stuff and clickbait within YouTube fitness, ultimately you have to adopt a moral position in how you see this stuff. I think the most useful position is probably just, just consequentialism where Ultimately, if the means you use to come to your ends are reasonable and your ends are honorable, I think it's fine. If you use clickbait as a means to actually spread a reasonable message and you've done your utmost to make sure the information you're providing in that video is really solid and you're not stretching things out of proportion, you're not giving people a wrong idea, you're not fear mongering about injury, like athlete and X for Christ's sake, like, please bro, just stop saying everything will destroy your joints. It's fine. It's not going to. I know it does well in terms of clickbait, but like, as long as your information is solid, I don't mind personally, from a consequentialist perspective, if you use a little bit of clickbait. And I do think that we ultimately need to play the game a little bit and level the playing field in that regard. Otherwise, we'll never get good information to people that want it. But I think that there is like a, a fine line. And I think that ultimately, as much as we can adopt a moral perspective on it and kind of look at it from a pros and cons perspective, a lot of it is just personality and what you're comfortable with. Someone might be very extroverted and feel like, you know what, like, as long as the information is good, I'll do anything in a thumbnail. I might depict like someone being beheaded just for like sensationalism. Whereas for a lot of other people, personally, they just don't feel comfortable with it. So as long as I think your moral compass is pointing in the right direction and your information solid, you're genuinely doing the work and not just trying to get a quick buck. That's all we can do. If you're going to deliver a proper message and you know in your heart, like this is going to get people results and you're not trying to mislead them with your clickbaity title or thumbnail, then fine, do what you gotta do. Or, or else we're just gonna lose out to the people who did misguide us because 
I think the, the real message here is that it goes down to the individual rather than the concept being discussed. And guys like myself, guys like NH, we were misled by those who did not have the purest of intentions and they projected their issues onto us. We fell for it and it ended up leading down to a problems that would last for years. And I think it's also a way that these people were trying to take away from their own responsibility as educators, because it's easy to say, just get strong at this, you know, especially if the number is so absurd that it probably will guarantee it to a certain extent. It's interesting because we started with, uh, with training and now we like, we went up the thread and we unraveled the entire fabric of YouTube fitness where naturally you want attention. You're going to do whatever it takes to get attention. And then once you have that attention, you get addicted to it. So you can't let go of the gimmick and you become a caricature of yourself. And then you're not free anymore. And you are suffering alongside your audience. And this is what I perceived with power building and this entire attempt at trying to claim that strength and size can be optimized at the same time, which Milo says is not possible, and we agree on that, because, well, it's what's the most appealing. What man does want to be massively big and massively strong? And uh, we are paying what we call les pots cassés en français, meaning that now we are dealing with the consequences and the fallback, and my video was an attempt at trying to correct some of that. In reality, it's just adding nuance. I think it's what's lacking into that entire discussion. What this debate brought, you gained a lot of nuance and perspective into the discussion, which can be applied to training. I agree entirely. The thing ultimately we have to recognize is that not every approach is for everyone. I think that, hey, with your channel title, Natural Hypertrophy, my assumption is people who are watching you are one natural and are interested mostly in hypertrophy. And so for your audience, the advice that power building isn't the best thing ever, absolutely valid. It's not as good as just pure hypertrophy training. But equally, I think there is a value in recognizing that, okay, power building doesn't optimize either powerlifting or hypertrophy, but it provides you a pretty good amount of both if you approach it right, right? Not everyone wants to maximize either powerlifting strength or either hypertrophy. And for those people, power building is absolutely fine if it conforms with their goals. Ultimately, this lifting journey is a personal endeavor. Whatever you want out of it is what you should pursue. For myself nowadays, for example, and I've competed in bodybuilding as well, it's hypertrophy mostly. I've done powerlifting in the past. I've done relatively pure powerlifting training in the past. And that's the thing with goals as well, is that they're the dynamic, right? They can change over time as pursue one thing versus the other, you do not need a single-minded pursuit of maximization of a given goal or endeavor. And so I think as long as you're aware of what you want, and as long as hopefully people like ourselves are putting out good information to help you get to that goal, we'll be in the clear. But I think we just need to communicate clearly like, look, this is what this does. This is what it doesn't do. And wherever possible, not to fall into hyperbole just for the sake of bringing in more traction. I've seen people online, for example, this with Lincoln Partials or even Powell like in this case, call an Obama nation, might be a hyperbole. Or I've seen people online with length of partials, like claiming that it's made a world of difference in their gains. That's also hyperbole, you know? Like we're not talking about a huge difference. And so I think we just need to stay honest with ourselves and not make it hyperbolic and stay having decent integrity fundamentally. I think these are perfect closing words. I also want to add uh, for the anecdote that I had heard about the concept of length and partials but I had no idea it was linked to you. And so it really goes to show also that the volatility of concepts in this sphere where you can create something and it takes a life of its own. And then you'll have people who will clickbait using your concept that you did your PhD on and they'll claim, oh, I'll turn you into Ronnie Coleman, bro. And you're sitting there like, uh, actually, I ran the study and no, it won't. So what are you doing with my baby? You should, it's, not, it's not fair. It's not fine to do that. But hey, that's the nature of the game. Well, we saw the same thing with the biomechanics people on uh, Instagram and TikTok. They straight up plagiarize the actual creators of this content without ever giving credit in any kind of way and made exaggerated claims. And it was usually a bunch of young guys, say 19 to 21 years old, who were saying things that not even the creators were agreeing with. But because they got popular, actually outperformed <laughs> the OGs, it led to a false ideology. And the same thing with the length and partials. You got some, I agree, length and partials are amazing. You know, Dr. Milo Wolf is the man that needs credit for this. But you're gonna have to come in and clarify. Hey man, I try. I think that it does take a life of its own. Uh, and it's funny because you can make all the caveats in the world sometimes. You can make all the caveats of like, okay, we don't know 100% yet how it works, whether it always works for every muscle group, every population, everything. The right people will just take it to the extreme and be like, yep, he said this, it's, uh, it's going to revolutionize your gains and what have you. So I think at every stage of that communication, from sort of its inception to the people who are spreading it on, science communicators or just idea communicators, please just... Just be reasonable. It's not that complicated. Check yourself. Or get checked.
I'm always happy to check people. So I think we basically adjust everything. There are some things that I've written down. If you want to drag this on. Well, my good friends, I'm on a book and my stomach is a rumbling. So I have 20 minutes and then I have some orange chicken to massacre. Well, one thing I did want to address is the idea that you don't need to compete in order to be a maximalist. Like you can still try to get as big as possible. And just to say, like, I only competed this year, a couple months ago, yet I was still trying to optimize hypertrophy. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, look, man, I 100% agree with that sentiment. And like, for clarity, I've been maximizing for years. I had periods where I was training 13 times a week. You hear me? Like... I've been doing this. Like, it's not as though I, I'm some sort of, uh, do you even lift two steps foot in the gym once a week? You get me? But the reason I mentioned that as an argument, essentially, I think that within our niche, and again, we are niche, as much as we have a following and even it's going somewhat mainstream slowly, like people are lifting more and more nowadays. I think the assumption that everyone is going to the gym to maximize hypertrophy is just not true. Our following very well might. And I think it can go both ways, right? If you're talking to someone who wants to maximize, and some people will, that's fine. For some people, it's about just getting the health benefits. For some people, it's about just being consistent and most about fostering motivation. And so just make sure that your message is ultimately geared towards the people you're trying to address and just make clear that, hey, power building may be an abomination. Again, shout out a thumbs up. Um, if you're trying to maximize hypertrophy, but that is an assumption. Bro, it's, I'm not even on my own computer. Uh, that's this is a secret, right? Trade secret. It's not even my place. But that's an assumption that the person you're speaking to wants to maximize hypertrophy. And so, just being clear about that, that's why I brought it up. It wasn't meant as a means to say, if you don't compete, who gives a shit, bro? Just go and lift. Like, I make my living off science. Science is the opposite of just go and lift and simplistic advice. So, that's where I came from. I also personally despise this notion that you're only allowed to be passionate about something if there is a payback, if there is a check that drops at the end of the month. I, I see this as a consequence of the modern world personally, where your productivity needs to have a tangible material conclusion or else you're wasting your time. I don't compete in bodybuilding and bodybuilding is a large part of my life. I train six times a week. Two, two hours a day, I optimize everything I can optimize, I'm obsessed about the training, this is what I love in life, I don't step on stage. I don't see why this gatekeeping that I see nowadays, some people attempt to pull this idea that if you don't compete in bodybuilding, you're not a bodybuilder. Being a bodybuilder is a state of existence. It's what you like. It makes no sense whatsoever. If you met someone who plays tennis every weekend, He's a tennis player. He's not winning Wimbledon or Roland Garros every year. He's still a tennis player. So it's dangerous, I think, this idea because it gives people an excuse to not take their own love and passion seriously. Or well, they'll be able to tell themselves, well, okay, sure, I'm not actually paying attention to what I do in the gym, but it's fine. I don't compete. Not, not correct. If you're a noob, it's okay to be a little bit vague, but as you improve, you're going to have to actually zero in and you're going to have to do your homework. For us, it's obvious because we're nerds and we talk about training all the time, but every single person I've known who had decent physique or strength as a natural pays attention to what they do. You don't just wing it in the gym. You log everything. You do everything properly. And, and this is, has nothing to do with the debate, but I have to say it. I also think it's dangerous to propagate that type of idea, this gatekeeping of bodybuilding, because if the only way to bodybuild is to compete, now you have to follow a number of standards that might not be best aligned with your ability to gain size as a natural bodybuilder, or worse, it could push you down the path of PDUs because you're going to start thinking, okay, to be a bodybuilder, this is required, and as we know, competition in bodybuilding rhymes with PDUs, and that's not the type of message that young men need to hear. It devalues what you do. And like you said with the PDs, you might follow enhanced standards. And we already see this with uh, the super low body fats and emphasizing a physique that is not necessarily res resemblant of the silver era guys. So even the natural bodybuilding standards are evolving to match what the top IFBB pros are doing. So they're getting closer and closer. Actually, the naturals are getting even more shredded, just to say. And uh, Dr. Mike told me that it's because we don't hold on to as much water weight. There's definitely some truth to that. Look, natural hypertrophy. You almost had me fooled there with a diatribe against PD use. You really think I trust someone whose name involves the word natural as if you're trying to convince me? Look, man, I, I just don't believe it. And all this mystery about your background, like, what's even your name exactly? Like, I don't know. It just doesn't, something doesn't seem right here. I'm, I mean, you could have just said that I'm French and stopped there. It's true. French are notorious for PD use, you know? The morning of a Frenchman is baguette and then inj injection in the butt every morning. 
I must have missed that in the in the manual for speaking French. That's my bad. We don't share our secrets with foreigners. That's why. If you know, you know. Any other questions you had written down? Well, the debate, everything was addressed, which is awesome. First time doing this, but I think you both did a tremendous job. And I think we, we came to a common agreement. Congrats to both of you for not strongmanning each other's positions. You really kept it professional. I love that. So regarding uh, questions, I mean, it would just be little semantics based off your initial videos that you made. I don't, I don't feel like we have to cover these things. I think that uh, we actually have a, a unique opportunity here to just say goodbye today, gather all that we have not spoken about. And if people are interested, if there's a positive response to the first video, we can get together again as a round table. I think that's great. I think the best way to round this out would be one, after this podcast, I'll make sure to uh, keep tagging in my stories of me flexing. So hopefully one day I, I won't have a spider physique anymore. And the other thing is maybe just give some final thoughts as to your position to kind of summarize it. I'll do the same and we can end it off there. I think that's a great idea. I'll be quiet now. So I come at it from a relatively evidence-based perspective. I've also done the thing. I've coached hundreds of people at this point. So I think I know a decent amount about this stuff, but my main information source is the evidence. Based on the evidence, there is absolutely some overlap, and I think substantial overlap, between how you should train for hypertrophy and how you should train for strength. However, there are a few things, like for example, the range of motion involved, like for example, the rep range you used, like potentially the frequency a little bit, and that sort of stuff in the RPE for each set, that are going to differ in how you would train for maximum strength and how you would train for maximum hypertrophy. And strength, by the way, as it relates to powerlifting. And because there are these disparities, there is not going to be an optimization of both capacities or abilities at once. There's going to be a trade-off. There's going to be some loss in both. Based on the evidence, and ultimately, I know we love to use quantitative values and numbers in the industry as a means to like communicate information. The evidence is actually the best way to actually arrive at those numbers. And based on the evidence we have, quantitatively, I would say you could honestly get about 80 to 90% of both at once. That's been my position from the get-go. I think that's true. I will never claim you can optimize both at once. That's simply not true. I think the relentless pursuit and the mindless pursuit of strength lifts or power lifts without thinking about why you're using them if your goal is hypertrophy, is misguided. I think you should consider why you're doing things, especially if you're able to optimize things or if you're competing in something. Equally, if you're someone who wants a good blend of both, feel free to power build. Just be aware that power building isn't like a singular approach. Power building approaches range on a spectrum from being super hypertrophy focused with just a little bit of strength work to being super powerlifting focused with just a bit of hypertrophy work. Where you fall on that spectrum should be carefully considered in alignment with your goals. If your primary goal is to get stronger, but you just want to get a better physique as well a little bit, you can fall on one end of the spectrum and vice versa. You just need to be clear to yourself about that and be aware that there are trade-offs. The trade-offs aren't going to be world chattering, but there are trade-offs. And I think that's where ultimately both natural hypertrophy and I agree. I would second that absolutely. For people who are expecting a bloodbath, I'm sorry. I'll do better next time. But ultimately, yes, we are both in agreement when it comes to this. I want to preface by saying that I personally don't have any credentials when it comes to exercise fitness. I don't have a degree. I have never coached anyone, not even a single person. I refuse to coach people. I think that you should path your own way and you're capable by yourself. All of the information is out there and I've never competed in bodybuilding. Then we can have those dick measuring contests about saying who's bigger between me and Milo. We'll, we'll see about that uh, if we ever meet in real life, which is unlikely to happen. But my conclusion in this is to say that we always discuss these remaining 10% or so 90% of your gain, 80% of your gain. All that is very good. To me, that's what I fight for is this 20%, this 10%, because I see and I think that this is what ultimately makes the biggest difference. So if you watch me for general advice, that's fine. But understand that I personally talk to people who want this 10% because they want to build something that is going to make them outside of the norm, that is going to place them outside of what regular people could get, at which point the approach that I teach is one that is, yes, not going to be power building. Beautiful. I think that was a great way to wrap up. So if anyone wants to find more information, let's just start with you, Dr. Marla Wolf, where can they do so? Hey man, thank you for that. Um, you can find me at Wolf Coaching on YouTube. That's the main place I've been active nowadays, trying to make a few videos a week. Hopefully they're informative based on the evidence. I also have an Instagram. You can find me at Wolf Coach, last name and Wolf, last name and Coach, sorry. Um, I don't just pick random animals to name myself after on social media, unfortunately. And you can find all my research if you just type in Milo Wolf Research Gate. There'll be stuff on range of motion. It'll be stuff on how close to failure should you train. Are you even accurate at how close to failure you think you are? That sort of stuff. You can find that if you just type in Milo Wolf Research Gate. What about you, Natural Hypertrophy? 
So I have two main ways of sharing my existence online. Uh, the first one is Instagram, where I mostly post homoerotic pictures of myself, flexing my abs, flexing my biceps to show you how big I really am so that you can take advice from me afterwards. And once I get, con I get you convinced with the honey and I get you onto the page, then you get bombarded with two hour long videos about philosophy that have nothing to do with bodybuilding. Once in a while, I will post a fitness video to remind people it's a fitness channel. But uh, if you are from the TikTok generation, my channel will give you an aneurysm. So I recommend not checking me out. For anyone else who has a lot of time to waste, you can check me out, especially if you like philosophy. Perfect. Well, I'll be sure to include both those links in the description box. Thanks again for the awesome debate. Hope the viewers learned a lot and come to their own conclusions. And that's it. Hope to do this again sometime and talk about some other fun things. Thank you for hosting, Alex. Thanks for hosting. My pleasure.